You're tuned in to RX Radio. Movement prescribed. Brought to you by Prescript.com. A personalized approach to keeping you healthy and making your best even better. Your hosts, Dr. Jordan Shallow and Dr. Jordan Jinta. recently found a stereotype that no one cares about like no one cares to that this is like possibly offensive and it's my favorite i love stereotypes there, there are stereotypes for a reason right and there there can be good stereotypes like i get stereotyped a lot for being canadian and then people realize i'm gonna be a bit of an asshole and they go huh i thought all canadians were supposed to be nice i'm like i'm jordan nice to meet you you know <laughs> don't judge a book by its cover you are very polite in in the appropriate situations though yeah i can turn it on yeah. and it's like I just there's a difference between kindness and weakness, and most people kind of think you're Canadian, you're kind of meek or whatever. But have I told you? Uh, I think we've talked about this in the past. It was in Ottawa. It was after like um, it was. I was in the middle of something. Maybe it was after nine eleven. It was a while ago. There's a YouTube video up. Did we talk about this? I don't think so. There was like two kind of like good old boy looking Canadians. Like literally, like one was wearing like red and black plaid. One had like an orange hat on, like hunting, like bear hunting hat. And they were sitting at uh, a bus stop in Ottawa, and there there was a social science program. I don't know some humanities program, psychology, sociology, or something like that. There was these four kid or three kids in the university. I think it was Carleton, and what the they were basically trying to uh, gauge public perception of Muslims in the in the world now, like in Ottawa. And Ottawa is not Ottawa is a fairly homogeneous population like there's not too much immigration not many people find themselves getting off the plane or the boat in northern ontario just going yeah here sounds good <laughs> um so they had one of their friends one of them was muslim so he had the full head to toe thing going on and you know i i understand the inherent racism and bias that comes <laughs> with the oversimplification of the full head to toe thing but <laughs> bear with me and then the other one guy was like a, um, an asian dude and the other guy was like a white kid they're all really good friends and they thought of this this project that they they were going to do where the the white friend was going to be the agitator the muslim friend was going to be dressed up traditional at the bus stop and then the asian guy was going to be recording the whole thing they were all lav mic'd up and the recording was candid from across the street and they wanted to see what the, i mean there's this idea of shared responsibility right like where um you know, there's that people got stabbed. There's some, someone got stabbed in New York and like 50 people saw it and no one called the cops because they all thought the other person was going to call the cops. So they thought, okay, what if we like publicly, and they were friends, but like publicly kind of called this guy out. Basically the scene was, we don't want to let this guy on the bus. Like, hey, dude, you're not getting on this bus because you're Muslim and you're afraid we're going to whatever. And so they did it in front of these like two very white looking, like you would say racist looking people. Like they just look like white trash guys. And... So as the scene unfolds, the guy's, like, giving the Muslim guy a hard time, and it's all part of the act. And, like, you just see this one guy in a plaid shirt just, like, assessing the situation. Like, they're talking, oh, yeah, you know, the, you know, the Leafs, eh? And the Leafs played the, the, the Canadians, and they won, and they're just talking bullshit. And then the guy hears what's going on and just turns and looks to the white guy who's talking shit to the Muslim guy. And you're thinking, like, oh, fuck, are you serious? Like, this guy's going to jump into And, like, the experiment was, I don't know if that was the goal, but it would have been, like, proven, like, okay, the public perception is very skewed. The guy looks at the white guy, looks at the Muslim guy, and hears what the white guy's saying, and he just fucking knocks the white kid out. <laughs> just one hitter, like no questions asked, right to the fucking dome. And like the Asian guy runs out of the bushes with the camera, like, no, no, no. And like the Muslim guy's like, no, dude, it was like a thing. We're friends. We were just fucking around. And the guy's like, yeah, I don't care. You shouldn't <laughs> talk like that to people. And I was just like, fuck yeah, man. That was like the proudest I've ever been to be a Canadian. But no, best stereotype ever baby daddies. By far the best stereotype ever. Wait, what does this have oh to do with that? Oh my god! Well, it's just like and what is the baby daddy stereotype? You drive a hatchback Civic, you have ear pierced, and you have a forearm to fat tattoo that says like "Familia" with the big famous stars and stripes. app. guaranteed, you're not married but have children. That's my favorite <laughs> stereotype ever. You have a bumper sticker that says "Illust." In the back corner of your, like, rusted fucking 82 Civic hatchback. Oh. <laughs> and you could say it and no one cares. Like, not a single person would ever defend 
a baby daddy. It's the best stereotype. Oh, I love it. Oh, man. You just named like three people I know. But how true is it? Yeah. Like you see it. Like you go like, your your child doesn't have a real father. Like that's, <laughs> when's the last time you saw your kid? That's so Between sad. Between going dude, to the auto body like shop, what are those, Pirellis on your 13 inch fucking <laughs> rims? Jesus, yeah. Yeah, good thing she'll have a nice birthday this year, you deadbeat. <laughs> it's my favorite. Oh, you'll see, now it's like, it'll be like a mattress sale. Like when you need a mattress, you see mattress advertisements all over the place. Your whole life. Is just going to be cutting off by hatchback civics that are lowered. They have like pink rims. The four, uh, it's, it's so good. <laughs> I want people, I'm not a big fan of voyeurism or canon stuff. If you're driving and you happen to see one, oh just take a picture. At, if it's safe to, take a picture and tag it. <laughs> it's safe to. Guaranteed. He's got like his, maybe like his daughter's name. We haven't seen like a year and a half, like tattooed on him somewhere. The, the, the silhouette or the, the portrait tattoo. Oh it's like, God. yeah, I'm t- it's the best stereotype because it's something that you can generalize. You can point out openly in public and even the most like leftist social justice person. Like, look at that fucking deadbeat. Like that no <laughs> one cares about baby daddies. And nor should they to a certain extent. Oh, fuck! it's dude. so good. Not a segue to anything, but I, I, just, I, don't, I don't know. How I to found that it up. hilarious that uh, just like stereotypes. I was I was ref- a friend of mine was in my office the other day and he's Indian. And we were just talking back and forth, and he was talking about, like, arranged marriages and stuff. And I was like, they still fucking do that? I was like, come on. There's enough here around. And, like, really good friends. And and we, he makes jokes about white boys and all this stuff. And there was an Indian guy in the gym right outside. And I was like, fuck, man. How many other? Like, one point something billion of you? Like, come on. You need an app for this? You need your parents to set you up? Figure it out. And, like, the guy was mortified. We were just joking around. But at the same time, like, the guy outside the door was like, Okay, he's playing off of a stereotype, and it wasn't cool. If I was shit-talking baby daddies, he'd be so, like, they'd be laughing along. There'd be high fives, like, fuck that guy. I just found it funny. All right. But, yeah, big things. (laughs) Big things. What a segue. Now that we have your undivided attention. Absolutely. Except for the baby daddies. They They have tuned out. It's fine. They'd have a short attention span anyways. <laughs> um, they didn't pay attention in health class, apparently. It's not hard. It's not hard, really. It's just a logistical error on your part. Um, where do we even start? With the hips. The hips, website, app, yeah, free program. Big things. Wow. <sighs> did, I, did I let the cat out of the bag? Um, did I jump the gun? No. Let's do it. But yeah. So it. right now, so this episode is um, going to be about offending people, and but primarily it's going to be about – um, hip, low back pain, knee pain. Um, so what we've done, so we have a new website, uh, www.pre-script.com. Um, and what we're doing to celebrate for all you guys who've listened, we're going to actually be rolling out once a month, a free program, um, through Prescript. This month's all going to be about hips. So this episode's all going to be about hip pain, how to fix it. And to everyone listening, we're going to get a free program. So if you go over www.pre-script.com, you can sign up. And we're going to send you two weeks of corrective program for hip, low back, knee. So it's going to be kind of a scaled version of our lower body reset and lower body overhaul programs. Um, just for tuning in past the initial. I think everyone deserves <laughs> something past that. If you've made it this far, yeah. you uh, deserve something for free. So we go to www.predescript.com right now. Sign up. We'll put a link in the show notes. Um, and this is going to be a two-week hip program. This episode will be kind of a a guide through how we address hip pain, common causes of hip pain or knee pain or low back pain, basically lower body dysfunction. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the app um, and then we'll kind of close off and we'll, we'll do this throughout the whole month of November. Um, but this, this episode will kind of be the opening, um, the opening score in, in this entire month where we're going to try and get um, some people on the program. Let us know what you think. Um, but yeah, completely free. Just go over, sign up and we'll send, we'll send over the app and all that. Um, where do you start? Assessment. It always starts with assessment. Okay. Um, history, what's going on? Um, are we going just hip? You want to go hip, knee, low back? Let's go most common hip, knee, low back. Like what do you see the most? Like I'd imagine a wide range of our audience does not live such a lavish, comfortable (laughs) Adirondack (laughs) lake lifestyle that we set up for ourselves. (laughs) Um, fucking dead. We're just, (laughs) we're just, yeah. I, you know what? I'm in the market for a new civic. Yeah. Um, (laughs) we're, we're just shy of getting like zero gravity chairs in this <laughs> in this place. Um, but yeah. no, so I mean, I would say the common one. Maybe let's let's go um, let's systematically. Let's start with like 
low back contributions or like hip contributions to low back pain yeah. and then we can go knee and then maybe specific to the hip yeah absolutely the most of the people i see on a daily basis if you lay down on a table or on a bed let your feet relax you're gonna flare way out and yeah. point 90 degrees to the to the walls um so usually the the cause that i'm working with is people that are seated all day um, whether it's in front, yeah, take coming kick off, them off, coming off, toes coming at you, baby daddy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the real sales pitch right here. Yeah. Yikes. Okay. Um, yeah. No. But, so that that passive external rotation of the hip, and a yeah. good way to mark that, and this is a trend that we'll talk about, is understanding the foot's relationship with the hip, because we worry so much about the loaded force going down into the ground that we forget about return ground forces coming back up being equal or opposite, right? So yeah. the feet are very telling and this will be something again we cover, but when that foot points to the uh, either side of the room, a lot of external rotation, they have a lot of tightness, a lot of instability. Yeah, absolutely. And usually with that, there is some sort of hip, knee, low back symptom. Yeah. Um, so that's telling me external rotators are very tight. We're not countering that out. Um, it could mean tightness with some of the, the internal rotators too, uh, but that's more expressed in kind of a flexed hip is what I notice. Um, so usually the, the culprits there are glutes, um, psoas, and then to some extent the quads, and then um, we'll get into the adductors kind of relationship in there too. But um, typically it's increasing rotation through the hip is what we need to work on. Um, when I see those those sorts of things, so internal external rotation, um, increasing hip extension, and then um, doing some sort of thing for the for the tone of the hip flexors. Okay. Okay. So a few things there. Starting off with assessment, and this would be something that people can do, and it correlates so strongly you wouldn't believe. It. If you're having hip knee knee or low back pain, lay face up and watch the side that is is have under duress or is painful watch that hip that foot is going to be uh, abnormally or asymmetrically um, externally rotated as an expression of the hip another assessment i mean for me the way i look at assessing the hips is understanding what true hip function is right like a lot of times we'll manifest these these presentations under load like squatting or deadlifting if you're only loading bilateral movements your ability to really screen for hip function is never really being tested. So mm -hmm. I look at it this way. Like if I gave you a gun and I said, I want you to shoot this thing, you could hit it. No problem. Right. And that's, but no one would say, man, Junta is such a good shot. He's so accurate that he can hit this, you know, broad side of a barn door from six feet out, but equally so. And the comparison I'll make is this is the required functional stability it takes to execute a squat properly in the hips, right? You're hiding so much of it in the structure. You're hiding so much of your inaccuracies in the close range target of the of shooting this giant thing, right? But now, if I said, "All right, we're gonna we're gonna put the H6, we're gonna put it in the middle of Al Camino in Sunnyvale, and I want you to pick it off," it's like, dude, you're like 15 miles out, and not six inches by four inches across. You'd be a fucking marksman if you could pick that off. Now that's assessing what true hip function is, which is gait cycle, right? Which is just fucking putting one foot in front of the other. Like, mm -hmm. let's let's move first before we start to load. And, and, like, it's literally running before you can walk. And squatting before you can walk is equally as asinine. So I'll take people through just a long stride walking lunge. It's taking this, turning it into that, and putting it down range. Right, so it's a matter of like, all right, let's calibrate. Let's calibrate for stability. Let's calibrate for range of motion. Let's see some of these passive expressions, how they look in real time when they, when they load. And you start to realize like, okay, that yeah, maybe we're not in this long range stride, walking lunge every single day in this, this severity of this end range of motion, that inaccuracy still exists. Even if we're shooting at this barn door and we're trending off course, because I know people whose hips are so fucked up, they hurt when they walk. Right, that's because you're missing the mark even from this close. So it's like if we can calibrate there, so something like a walking lunge, um, and start to address some of the assessments that we're seeing, because you'll see people who they can take a step forward um, to a certain degree, which is passive hip extension of that foot that they're leaving back, that they can't actively get back to that same spot. It's like all right, the discrepancy. 
and I think that's a huge thing that we're going to talk about is is symmetry, symmetry between front and back, quads and hamstrings or glutes, hip extension versus hip flexion, internal rotation versus external, adduction versus abduction. I think this is where a lot of the, the really strong research lies is in these in these asymmetries of not necessarily range of motion, um, strength, or in, in a lot of cases, stability. Um, so after assessment, so we'll stick with like the low back to start. Um, you mentioned like tonicity of the hip flexors, which I really like because a lot of people at home, they think, okay, I have a tight hip flexor, which sure, but which one, right? Because right. the hip flexor is a designation of muscles that contribute to a certain action. Um, it's not one muscle. Yeah, absolutely. So how do you go about assessing it or what do you do as far as treating it? Um, or or let's give them a little sampler into the program. What are some what are some exercises that you like in maybe order that we progress them through maybe in these two weeks that are going to address hip flexion? So basically get people into hip extension. Yeah. What do you like? Um, kind of just what you already started with is a walking lunge is one of my favorite things um, just to get into hip extension. That's something that we spend. I mean, if you're working at a desk, you spend zero time in that position every day besides maybe when you're walking to a small degree. But this is, again, exaggerating it out, getting that hip into full extension and getting that pelvis to tilt. Um, it's a really good way to, to assess and treat that, um, that range of motion. And then with that, um, I really like things like a split squat, something you can work um, stability on one leg, flexibility on the other side. Um, so you're bringing that hip into extension um, and then really drilling that single leg stability on your stance leg. Uh, things like that can be really helpful in that. Um, and then things to make some sort of neurological change, right? So so the, the neurological tone is just you adapting to the position that you're in most often, right? So you have to give your body some sort of way of knowing it's okay to, to release that, to get out of that position, go to the opposite end of the spectrum of that that place that you are you know nine ten hours a day um so a lot of that can be just um static stretching with the with the breathing control or um even active stretching with with the breathing control some sort of loaded stretching things like that um whether it's a band or maybe um a counterbalance squat things like that can be really good uh, to actually get you through that full range of motion for the hip. Yeah, and I would say, and the way this program is going to be set up, it's, I mean, it's going to be not entry level, but it's going to try and catch a lot of people. A lot of Absolutely. people, because there's considerations you can make, because we just talked about hip flexion like it's a linear pursuit, like straight front and back. Right. But it's like, I mean, you're like the king of lateral movements. And lateral movement doesn't just exist within the coronal plane as we break through the sagittal, but it's, it's also exists in in equal degrees of every range of motion, right? Like you can hip extend and adduct, you can hip extend and abduct, you can mm -hmm. hip extend and internally rotate, which I would suggest highly. You can hip extend and externally rotate. So I think too, another piece that we're gonna look into, as especially when it comes to this two week program is it's gonna be static stretching is always gonna be one of the main drivers, the first. So it's like breaking out of these chronic positions that we're in. Uh, and then progressing the dynamics, right? So the program is going to be laid out that we have four days a week. So two are going to be prior to your lifting sessions and two are going to be PM recovery sessions. So static stretching, something like a, like a couch stretch, like you mentioned the quadriceps as, as a co contributing factor to hip pain as it pertains to low back dysfunction. A lot of times people have, like when things get tight, they get tight centrally and they start to get tighter as you work out to the peripheral, right? So understanding that hip flexion or hip flexors is a, uh, it's a multi-joint bias, right? So there's hip, but if, if you also have an inability to uh, keep your knee in passive flexion while your hip is in extension, your quads or your rectus femoris are tight and that's contributing to the bias towards hip flexion. So something like a couch stretch to yep. start uh, and then making sure we neutralize the position of the pelvis, utilize the core to keep that lumbar spine from going into hyperextension. Like there's a lot of moving parts to, to the hip and addressing it systematically. And the other one that I really like is the dynamic foam roll, the iliotibial band. So I think that's really misunderstood and the ITB and maybe that'll be a good way to start bridging the gap between the hip and low back to the knee. Yeah. Um, Cause I find with the programs that we've sent out, we kind of get typecast for powerlifting and, and, um, Olympic weightlifting or CrossFit runners, the programs that I use for runners and ultra marathoners that I work with, this is a staple across the board. Like, so your iliotibial band is it's connective tissue. Like if I said, 
if you came to me and were like, hey, bro, like my calves are really tight. And I said, oh, dude, uh, just like lacrosse ball your Achilles tendon. Like, that sounds like a terrible idea. <laughs> like, why would I? But it's the same It's the same underlying principle. Like, the iliotibial band is a, it's connective tissue, right? It, it's not, you can't contract necessarily your iliotibial band. You can contract muscles of the hip utilizing proper stimulus of strength and stability and they calls on that iliotibial band to exact movement at the knee and then uh, and, and down the sh- down the line the foot so like the dynamic foam roll of the itv it's like okay what are we really addressing when we're foam rolling the iliotibial band like when we're laying on a foam roller we're just rocking back and forth it's like we're not breaking anything up the itv is not necessarily moving or changing shape it's not like we're kneading pizza dough with a pin that stuff's not going to move it takes like over a thousand pounds per square inch of force if you take a cadaver to actually start deforming the tissue of the iliotibial band like it's resilient fucking tissue so you know your run-of-the-mill tacoed fucking foam roller at 24-hour fitness is not going to do it internalize the stimulus understand that underneath that's your vastus lateralis that's a strong extender of your knee go through flexion extension so that to me when it comes to low back hip because that's a messenger that's going to be like how does hip dysfunction show up as a light on the dashboard at the knee mm-hmm. like people have a hard time in the office or, or online like your knee issue is coming from your hip this is what your knee does roughly speaking the the femoral tib- the tibial femoral joint the patellofemoral joint do this it's a hinge but if there's an aberrant signal in the other two ranges of motion going through that hinge. You're going to start to have lateral knee pain. You're going to start to have medial knee pain because this is happening. Like you're not getting that articulation as it should be, as it goes through what it should do, flexion extension. And the ITV is a big contributor to that. Yeah, absolutely. And then as we take uh, this sort of approach to this sort of thing, then uh, number one is we have to make sure that we have the full range of motion, right? Um, to to the best of our abilities, right? And a lot of times that's just making those neurologic changes, um, internalizing that stimulus or getting you to move in a way um, for circuits or for rounds that's going to let your body know, oh, it's okay to be in this range of motion. I know I've been sitting, I've been in this one position for such a long period of time, but if I move this certain way and I kind of ease into it, every time I can get a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Um So we have to make sure we have uh, range of motion. Um, Then, once we have that range of motion, we have to stabilize it. That's that's um, the (laughs) I know. That's the big key to all this stuff: getting you out of pain, getting you functioning. Um, So, like like you mentioned earlier, the squat is a very three dimensional movement, right? That hip is a ball and socket. It has a huge amount of range of motion. Um, So we have to make sure that we have that range of motion in all directions, and that we can control that range of motion in all directions so that's when the things that we talk about all the fucking time come into play like the the single leg stuff the unilateral work so a single leg deadlift bringing that trunk through flexion extension getting those flexors extenders rotators all to work in one very integrated pattern if you will um it's again a fantastic diagnostic tool if you can't do it you suck at it then we know we need to work on stuff um but that's also the the prescription is to get better at this thing, and then your pain is probably going to decrease as you get better at it. And I think that's a good point. Like obviously, the stability point is something that I harp on a lot. But this image, I think, if this is your femur head, if this is your hip socket, put a ball of paint there in your mind. Put a d- doll of paint right at the top, and think by the time your warm up is done, you'll have covered like just Sistine Chapel. This bitch. Like, get with the foot on the ground. That's the biggest key, especially when it comes to stability. Range of motion stuff, we're going to passively getting, we're going to work passively first to get you into end ranges of motion where you then have to stabilize. The biggest misconception I get is, I don't get it, dude. I stretch all the fucking time. It's like, exactly. You bring your body to transient end ranges that it's not used to being into, and then you put it under load. You put it under threat, and your nervous system goes, hold on. What the <laughs> fuck are we doing here? And what are yes. we doing here with this much load? So reciprocally, what it's going to do to to decrease the likelihood of structural damage at these end ranges, where that's the only stability you have trained, is it inhibits everything that will allow it to get into that position. It puts a functional cast over the hip. So people who just stretch or just foam roll or just lift, like there are people who go, oh, you don't need to stretch, just squat. It's like that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> if you want to squat a lot and for a long time, 
Or even too, like if you do get injured squatting, and guess what? Shit's gonna happen. Your best asset in returning back to an injury is gonna be your baseline stability and understanding that stability is gonna be a separate stimulus and strength, right? Like if and how to progress and how to scale. And this is what this two weeks is about is like we can take you very quickly from immobile. Like I have a, one of my clients I train just for rehab purposes. I just use prescript principles. I use parts of a program and I adapted it to him. I put in some things that were specific to his his dysfunction patterns. And I got an email within three days. And this guy's like literally the tin man. Like his mm -hmm. fascia is made of like aluminum. But it's all it's it's not about structure, and that's where people got to get out of their heads or get in their heads because it's all about the neurological down regulation. It's about that yeah. that perception of stability at the end range. So we can create an end range. We can worry about like pain modulation, down regulation. That's usually the second tier order stuff. That's your lacrosse ball. That's your foam roller with an internal stimulus. So that's going to be, you know, utilizing your own nervous system to create motion while an external stimulus of a a kettlebell handle jam somewhere it's just it's drawing attention to your nervous system like hey here here as you're driving this force through pay attention pay attention to this pay attention to this so it's giving you just a little bit of extra sensory input which is going to tax the the that finite resource of, of your nervous system's capacity to manage movement as a whole and then it's going to start to rewire things then when you integrate the stability work and then integrate it in with working out so it's going to be two days lifting so say you squat and deadlift. This is probably the best way to do it if you do squat and deadlift sessions. Or uh, I w how would you integrate it with uh, like a snatch and clean workout or something like that? Yeah. Or a front squat. Yeah, same way. S take the program. If you have a lower body dominant day and your first movement or whatever your first movement is, integrate these movements in. So each one has a video link, pulls up on the app. It tells you duration, how long to hold the stretch, how many reps if it's something a little bit more dynamic. And then after you've gone through one cycle of it, say it's front squat front squat the empty bar go through all of it again front squat your first warm-up set 95 pounds go through all of it again 135 three to five times through and tell me it doesn't make a difference right these changes happen so fast because we're not focused on changing structure yeah. that takes forever and a day if it's possible at all neurological you can make a change so quickly Absolutely. so i think that's hip and hip and knee do you want to talk ankle and how it comes into the, like this whole mess of the hip because that's my biggest thing is like imagine for a second this is your foot and this is your femur right if you don't have stability here your foot's trying to do this the entire time like if you stand on one leg right now if you're listening if you can and if it's safe stand on one leg and watch what your foot does your foot gets reactive your foot's literally trying to find a center of gravity that keeps moving underneath it right so if you can just set the trajectory from the from the top down and go all right here's your hip stability ankle do your thing right plantar flex dorsiflex, flex invert evert do whatever you want rather than creating a functional cast just from being so overused like oh fuck where the hell is this goddamn thing going next right because um, ankle mobility is something that i mean you must see a lot in olympic weightlifting yeah absolutely and <laughs> you gotta you get away you stray stray beard hair yeah, fuzz. i think it's from the puppy fair enough we got a puppy uh, <laughs> um yeah, no, that's ankle ankle mobility stability is is a huge thing in Olympic lifting because it's so quad dominant and it's so range of motion dependent. You want to fucking slam yourself into the oh. bottom of that squat as quick as you can, and you want to not be have to make that face every oh. time you do it. Um, so yeah, I hundred percent agree. It's it's going to be top down stability. Um, when you have one leg on the ground so that when you have both legs on the ground, you can create uh, a closed system with a lot of tension between that whole thing and know that you're not going to have to guess where you want to be or where it's going to be. Yeah. It's the idea um, is be creative, not reactive. That's the big difference. Yeah, exactly. Because um, Olympic weightlifting, in a way, is is both of those things, right? We're creating this, this position, but... Um, we're also reacting to, you know, what little things may have went wrong during that lift. Um, so you have to be a good amount of both, but either way that comes back to joint stability all the way from, you know, wrist in every single joint all the way down to your feet. Um, so starting from the hip you know, and building that stability down so that you can be on one leg and you can control that motion no matter what then that's going to transfer over really well to a very balanced squat position once you get both feet on the ground. 
because if you're if you if there's some sort of imbalance um you can hide it very well with both feet on the ground right you can push maybe 60 percent through that right leg into that left leg and and maybe you get a little bit off center a little bit rotated through that through that pelvis but from the outside looking in maybe it looks okay maybe you know you can do the snatch you can do the clean whatever it is but that's just a recipe for for injury down the road right and it's it's really easy to hide that when both feet are on the ground but if you can't create that stability from one side to the other you're really going to feel it once we start to and that's the thing what you're hiding it in is you're hiding it in structure right absolutely si joint knees yeah lumbar discs exactly that's a big thing too like we talked about ground forces out of the gate like the ground is pushing back to equal or opposite force that you're putting into it right with the weight on the bar that's that return journey of the dysfunction set from the hip into the, I think of it this way. Like if I had a laser beam and I was trying to point it right at the camera and it's a mirror that's pointing right back to me, if there was something, if that camera was off and my laser beam was straight, that's not going to come right back. Or if my, my laser beam from the start, so my hip is out of position and I'm aiming at something that's still going straight back, it's still going to end up off course. So that's the relationship between the foot and the, the hip and the ankle. The hip and the ankle is we need to make sure we're setting the right trajectory for the weight that we're loading down into the ground that's using this as a main hub of stability, mm -hmm. especially with lower body dominated movements. And then we also need to think, okay, how is my foot going to be returning that ground force back into the hip? And very rarely is that trade-off going to be fluid. Is the same path that it's going to take on the way down be the same on the way up? So I think the 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 ankle and the hip relationship, like more often than not, when people have tight calves, then uh, they stretch them and they stretch them and they stretch them. It's like when they're walking around all day, it's like shooting that thing, right? If you're trending off course for so long, and you know it's volume and intensity, sure, walking is very low uh, intensity, but it's very high volume. You know, you be taking 10, 15,000 steps a day, and you're accumulating summative ground forces back through the system, and you're mm -hmm. always having to recalibrate and react through the foot. Um, and if you don't have the ability to assess, or you haven't been working on um, working on improving function and it's like part of this this two-week program was just like i see such good changes in my office with giving someone such a very small intervention and that's what like conservative healthcare should be all about is the most amount of change with the minimum amount of intervention so um if you haven't downloaded it already go to this, go to prescript.com and download it um or, or send us or sign up for it and we'll send it to you but you'll be surprised like how quickly your body wants to make these changes because when you start to calibrate that laser pointer and the reflective surface, the hip and the ankle, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden you're calibrating your stability with every step. You're not trailing further off course by some like uh, summing up more ground forces through a improper pattern and reinforcing damage into structure. You're actually loading into proper function, and that starts to become more. Um, more central, more like bullseye, more accurate. So you'll hit an elbow in the curve where when your hip function really starts to manifest itself in your day-to-day -day and you, you're you going to bed at night and your feet are straight to the ceiling, one's not cranked off to the side, guess what? Those lateral rotators, they're recovering from the work today. They're not hypertonic and stressed and in a, height, a heightened state of, like, um, of threat and not recovering at all. They're staying active. And then you'll notice your warm-ups start to get shorter and shorter and shorter. And that's the goal is, like, it's not – you know, you, you don't want to have these long warm-ups with this net effect. You want to have a, a very isolated, a very distilled, a very concentrated approach. And it's like in dealing with the amount of stuff we've dealt with when it comes to hips, knees, and low back and ankles, lower body dysfunction. It's like this is a very accurate depiction of like what 95% of the people present with. You Like you said, hip flexion, very hypertonic or very stiff in the ability to extend the hip especially extension and internal rotation mm -hmm. but we can't really get to internal rotation without improving extension so that's kind of in the program it's like let's improve hip external hip in extension first then as we start to chip away at that let's start introducing internal rotation because that's where we're going to get our stability from in the hip to balance out the adductors and the abductors or the internal rotators and the external rotators um, so i just think understanding where things go wrong that's the thing. Everyone does the same thing when they train. They do the same thing. But equally so, everyone doesn't do the same thing. That uh, that adage of like, I'm going to stretch and then I'm going to train and then I'm going to stretch again and then I'm going to train is like, that's so antiquated. Do you have a favorite? Let's go top three. 
Top three lower body exercises? Top three that are your top three in the program. Because some are your babies. Some, some that I do a lot are these are Junta, Junta gold sealed, like. I love it. That warms yeah, my first heart. like ballot Hall of Fame movements. <laughs> and they're all Juntas. Um, Let's go one static, one like myofascial release, one um, stability. Cool. Um, static. My my, f I think the most bang for your buck is a internally rotated and flexed hip stretch. So like a frog position. Okay. Or um, even a seated um, single leg, uh, in just internally rotated hip position. Yeah. Um, I think that's fantastic. It's something that really gets neglected. You'll see people doing tons of external rotation stretches. Yeah, I do my pigeon every day. All this stuff. <sighs> Yeah, all right, cool. But um, I think that's a, a a really powerful static stretch that if you're doing it right, you'll see some really good improvement and a lot more comfort just on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, myofascial. My cross ball, foam roller. Yeah, kind of to couple with that, um, if you can get into those deep – external rotators of the hip with a lacrosse ball in sort of a figure four position. Um, I think that can be a really good one. And then what are we going? One Stability. Active. Stability. Yeah. So, or active. I know you kind of like yeah. to do some prep work. I like some of the stuff you do oh, bilaterally. I, I love it though. I, I, there's it's like his so children. Many. I You're know. trying to pick a child here. There's so many it's like good Sophie's ones Sophie's choice of fucking um, corrective exercise. The one I've been digging lately is um, – I don't I don't know whether it's called a lateral lunge or a Cossack squat, but it's um You and your set. You love you love getting lateral with it. I love it. It's I your love favorite it. Favorite thing. I think ever. it's it's one of the best movements to hit all three planes yeah. in my mind and exaggerate the neglected planes. Um so you get a really so the way I'm talking is if you get your feet just outside shoulder width, maybe turn those toes out a little bit and you lunge um into one side, doesn't matter where you start, but instead of going back to the top and then down to the other, you just slide right across. So you get that good push-pull relationship between the adductors and the glutes. Um, you're getting into the hip that you're lunging into should look identical to the bottom of your squat position. And then from there, you're pushing and pulling with the glutes back and forth. It's, it's, you'll, you'll feel in the adductors, the hamstrings, the, the quads, the glutes, um, hip flexors, all of it. This is how he looks when he talks about burritos. This is like, a, this is passion. You, you this is what cord, it is. You no, it's just like, me. holy Kozak, holy um, Christ. Uh, all right, I'm going to give my – because some of yours are actually in. Not the ones you've done, but the ones you've introduced to me over the years. Um, yeah. Okay, static stretch. Ooh, couch. I think most people, when it executed properly – and that's the nice thing about the program is the all the stuff has video description in it. Yes. So you go into the app. It's all laid out. Program will upload. You just go day one, click, and then it'll take you right to it. So the couch stretch is – I think it's done the most – it's done the most, but it's also done the most – frequently incorrectly if that makes sense like yeah, people absolutely. that do it they accommodate in the low back there's a lot of anterior pelvic tilt hyperextension the lumbar spine we're missing the boat when it comes to actually addressing the underlying issues like mobility stability is all about relative joint position so we need to make sure that the pelvis and the hip and the knee and the ankle and to a large extent the lumbar spine are in proper position to create that stretch because you'll create that stretch a lot earlier than you think a lot of people are like oh no i can get my heel right to my butt it's like really Let's see how you do it correctly. So I would say static stretch. I really like. Um, I really like the couch stretch. Dynamic foam roll. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go like. I want to go two. Go because two. I can't pick. Go two. Um, ITB dynamic foam roll. The ITB I think is huge. Yep. That internalization of the stimulus under that deep pressure of the foam roller is just. It's such. It makes such a difference to people who. Oh no! I, I foam roll my ITL all, all the time. It's like, just hear me out. Try it. And see whether it's clicking at the knee or popping at the hip. Usually that can clear it up within a single bout. Or TFL, kettlebell handle the TFL. Love it. So you're internally rotating that hip. You're getting the glute out of the way. You're spending time in internal rotation of the hip, which I think is huge. You start to see how a lacking internal rotation of the hip can affect the position of your spine. People will struggle with this on one side because they'll have a hard time holding onto the kettlebell and staying in position because they realize that the lack of internal rotation of my hip is actually going into my spine and forcing my spine to rotate. It's like, yeah, no shit. That lack of rotation is there every time you load your spine when you squat. So that needs to be cleared up. So I think the, you know, it's, it's drawing the nervous system's attention to, hey, pay attention here, pay attention here, pay attention here. While we're in this position, we're never in trying to improve some of, even some of the passive structures of the hip to allow for that uh, ease or mobility into internal rotation. I think that's, those two are my favorite, the ITB and the TFL. Um, and then the stability. 
as a graduated measure, I think the hip airplane is really hard to beat. Like, mm-hmm. and this is a challenge we put out a couple of weeks ago. Like, assume your squat stance. So figure out how many degrees of relative abduction due to gra- like next to gravity or a plumb line of gravity from your hip down. So like, say I'm here, my right leg is I don't know maybe 20 or 30 degrees. Now plant this leg on the ground. Go into a single leg RDL, so chest parallel to the floor, opposite hip into extension, like. And then try and open up from the pelvis to that same 30 degrees. Obviously, try and go more. But like I talked about the Sistine Chapel. It's like, okay, it's almost, it would be my Kozak squat. All right. Near and dear to the heart. Because what we're doing is we're not working the, the, the sagittal flexion extension. We're working through that coronal. We're working through that plane of lateral movement. And we're doing it with, you know, reinforcing the stimulus of stability at its highest order without loading weight. This is manipulating your own center of mass and your own base of support. And I think the results you can get with something like that when integrated into your loading. So you're going to go two loading days, 2 p.m. recovery sessions. And then you're like something like a hip airplane would probably be seen right before a deadlift or a squat. Yep. Something like uh, the couch stretch is going to be seen first. So you're th- in order, you would see, for example, couch stretch, um, foam rolly ITB, and then hip airplane. And that's not going to be one of them, but they'll be in order at some point during those two weeks and then squat and then do it again. Just watch your range of motion increase between every single set. Watch your pain decrease. Watch that perception of how things are moving in synergy with one another. Watch that start to come to fruition yep. and so watch things start to clear up. It's a beautiful thing. I Dude, I dig it. I, it, it. It makes me warm in the heart. It gives me all, all the, you know, yeah. all the fuzzy butterfly feelings. Um, so head over now. This will be available all month. Um, so do, go www.pre-script.com. Um, so you can sign up there and we'll send it over. Um, and so it's all on the app. It all has the video stuff linked into it. If you have any questions, Instagram at, uh, pre underscore script. If you like it, tag us in it, uh, head over to iTunes, uh, five star rating and review London Jack productions. Um, and yeah, this will be something we, we talk about in episodes to come this month. Um, but get your hands on it. Uh, and then just let us know what you think. Cool. Cool. Thanks for listening, guys.